What's going on? Welcome into the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter at Bernier underscore Matt. Today is Monday, February the 8th, 2021. This is episode 52 of the program. The more things change, the more they stay the same. It's the Monday after the Super Bowl, and Tom Brady is still winning Super Bowls, which it feels like it's been for my entire life. The only difference is for me now, he's doing it in different colors. It is what it is. Uh, that part didn't bother me. Gronkowski playing better than he has really in three years. That bothers me. And I'm including the fact that he retired for a year. Neither here nor there. We're not going to get into that. I digress. Uh, coming up on this week's show. Well, first things first. If you're new to the program, welcome. If you're curious where you can find it. I mean, you've found it somewhere, but you can find this anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Download it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, in the moneypodcast.com. Many, many places to find this thing. If you are someone who likes to watch along, specifically for the Friday feature or for these Derby prep recaps, you can head on over to YouTube, search bar, Matt Burney, your show, and get this episode along with the 51 prior. This week's show, we're going to go over the two points races, as far as the boys were concerned, for the Kentucky Derby this past weekend. The Withers at Aqueduct, the Sam F. Davis at Tampa Bay Downs. We will then pivot into the Friday feature, which this week is a, I thought it was a great segment. I really had a good time chatting with both Peter Appleby and Peter Visco. Now, it was supposed to be four of us. Tom Espinosa, unfortunately, couldn't make it. We'll get Tom back on the program at some point in the future. But the three of us that were able to get together, we chopped up the late pick four at Oaklawn Park on Friday afternoon Part of that sequence, the nightcap, race number nine, is going to serve as the Friday feature for this week. So we'll give you some ideas, some opinions, a bit of a ticket if you want to play it, if you want to throw it out, do whatever you want with it. But we'll also give you some horses for that Friday feature. If you want to be in the position that both of the Peters were in this week, you need to leave your selection beneath the video player on YouTube. If you're correct, I will contact you. I'm also curious from a content standpoint, let me know, again, you know the drill, beneath the video player or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt. If you prefer this format for the Friday feature, if you prefer sort of a multi-race sequence with the Friday feature itself as part of it, because at least that way you get a little bit, you get some opinions on some other racing. You can decide if you want to play it. If you don't want to play it, you're not just stuck into one race. I think it's interesting. Both of the Peters seem to agree with that as well. So uh, let me know your thoughts again beneath the video player on YouTube. And we will wrap things up after that with an update on the $500 challenge. So plenty to get to in this week's show. Uh, Hopefully you have had a a good weekend and and a good week leading into this. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you're starting to see some potential horses that are that are catching your eye, making you look twice, maybe do a little bit of a deeper dive. Because I think it's early. We haven't got to the big preps yet. You're going to have another big one coming up here this weekend with the Risen Star down at the fairgrounds. But I think you're starting to, at least I feel like I am, starting to see some horses who offer some appeal. That's all I'll say. We'll get into it when we talk about some of these prep races. Let's kick things off going back and taking a look at the Withers from Aqueduct this past Saturday. Grade three Withers from Aqueduct this past Saturday. Uh, the question for me always, year in and year out with New York, or the path anyway, through New York to Kentucky for the Derby, is just how good are the horses? Because the track itself can be a little bit funny. It's super slow this time of year. You know, you obviously you can see everybody on the grounds. By the way, this video is from Naira's YouTube channel. You can find all the stakes that they upload over there, all the other content that Naira uploads over on their YouTube channel. Many racetracks are pretty good about that nowadays, but uh, again, tip of the captain, Naira and company over there. You can see the snow. You can see everybody with their, you know, their gloves and their mittens and, and whatnot on. So it's always just an unknown. And recently, the, the path, frankly, just hasn't been that good. So I, when I see a horse like Risk Taking, who I figured was going to take more money than the 5-2 to two morning line. I thought he was the most likely winner, but I just, you know, I didn't need to find out at a shorter number than that. I ended up going with uh, Royal Number, who finished fourth at 10-1. to one. I'm always curious to see what they look like and then what they ultimately end up coming back to do. We're going to let the tape roll. There are two horses in particular I want to kind of focus this, this little recap on. Risk-taking and overtook. Risk-taking is the five. Overtook is the number six. Because I think they both are very promising for different reasons and potentially at different times this year. So 
neither of them are going to show a great deal of early foot. You're going to see Capo Kane, the number three, go out there, set the fractions. And for a mile and an eighth in February at Aqueduct, it's a pretty good clip. The six specifically, keep an eye on Manny Franco right here aboard Outlook, or excuse me, uh, Overtook, because he just uh, he just doesn't seem to have a great deal of interest in running at this point. And when I say that, I mean more that he's kind of, he, he seems a little lazy, a little bit outpaced. And yes, they were going an honest clip. Again, Capo, uh, Capo Kane's going to go out here, get this opening quarter in 24 flat. But I just, I, I'm fascinated by the performance from Overtook. And we'll dive into that more momentarily. You keep an eye on the Clarevich Silks here in between runners. The number five, Eric Cancel has the ride on risk taking. The, the thing that's most fascinating about this race to me is the agility that a horse like risk taking shows when by all accounts and, and visually and breeding wise, he's going to want to go longer. And I don't think agility and distance necessarily always go hand in hand. But I, in my opinion, this horse is going to display a fair amount of agility. And it's not that he has to do anything wild. But to come up here, you're going to see momentarily as they enter the far turn, he'll split horses very comfortably. And you see that Cancel's not really asking him to do a heck of a lot. He's doing it all on his own. Meanwhile, just compare the two. The way that Eric Cancel is riding risk-taking and the job, I mean, Manny Franco's working overtime on Overtook. And it's simply because... I don't think Overtook knows what the hell's going on just yet, but I digress. We'll get to him more in a bit. The winner is moving very sweetly here, and let's give credit to Capo Kane. I thought he ran a really good race. You're going to see him drift a little bit down the lane. That, to me, is the indication that perhaps, well, it could be twofold. Maybe this pace was entirely destructive, and based on the chart, I don't know that I could t totally argue with you. I get the vibe that he's going to be better going shorter. I think a mile, mile and a 16th is really his bread and butter. Meanwhile, you see risk taking now about three, four paths as they turn for home. He's going to hit full stride. And I love the way that he's finishing. When I'm taking a look at this the first time through and even the first replay through, I'm going, oh, buddy, we got something here. And you're going to see something for those of you who have listened to this show for any length of time or have watched any of these things. You're going to see this right about now. He's going to pop to his left lead, and it just it drives me up a wall. But but there is a caveat here. You see risk-taking wins. You see overtook comes from way out of it. I'm going to re rewind it to the top of the lane. All right, coming off the far turn. Why not? The good news about risk-taking is, and you can find it if you are someone who you subscribe to something like RTN or I believe Naira Bets, you can get the head-on or the head-on replays of the uh, the Naira races. The good thing about risk taking when he pops to his left lead, he pretty quickly writes the ship and goes to his right lead just past the wire. So I don't know that it bothers me as much as it would had he just gone to the left lead and stayed on it. Um, because, you know, it could be a combination of things. It could be him getting tired. Uh, keep in mind, this is also his first time against winners. Uh, this is his second race in a row at a mile and an eighth. But it could have been a number of things. He also was well clear at that point. He could have just got a little bit bored out there, and, and that happens from time to time. But all things considered, I thought this is a pretty good effort from risk-taking. Now, again, just look at, compare and contrast Eric Cancel, again, in the Clarevich Silks, and the Rapoli Silks here with Manny Franco and Overtook, because you're, you're just going to see two totally different scenarios with the riders. Manny has just had to work so, so hard to get this horse involved. You're going to see he's a little bit late to change leads, still on his right lead, still on his right lead. He's going to change over now. Excuse me, he was on his left. Now he's on to his right. But he levels off and finishes quite well down the lane. And to me, this is a, a, a perhaps a story of two different paths to bigger and better. And what do I mean by that? When I take a look at the race and I look at the chart, you see risk-taking wins. He wins by almost four lengths. He earns an 89 buyer speed figure in the process. Overtook runs second at 9-1, to one, 83 buyer. For what it's worth, Capo Kane, third, 81. Risk-taking gets his final eighth of a mile in 13-17, which at this time of year at Aqueduct, for again, his second time, his first time against winners, second time at a mile and eighth on the main track. I think there's a lot to like there. 
You look at the pedigree. There's a lot to like there. Medallia Doro, you see the distorted humor on the bottom. You see the connections. You see Chad Brown. You see some of the other horses deeper on the damn side of the pedigree. You got King Kugat. You got uh, you, you predominantly turf, but that's no surprise. Distance isn't going to be the thing that gets this horse beat. It's going to be a matter of tactically, is he too far back? And is he good enough? Well, at least from a tactical standpoint, this is the kind of race that gets me a little bit intrigued because, again, go, I go back to that sort of agility piece going down the backside, splitting horses the way that he did. For horses who typically look like longer is going to be better and they're not blessed with that natural early gas, you know, ag- agility might isn't something that should just be taken for granted or expected. For him to move the way that he did through traffic and finish the way that he did, and this is two straight races that he has powered home down the lane, you you couple that with the fact that it's happening at Aqueduct in February when the track is deep and slow and just doesn't yield fast times. I'm very interested by this horse. I, I think there is a real case to be made that risk-taking is one that you should consider at the very least as a fringe contender, if not, take him seriously if you're somebody who likes greatest honor i think you should at least consider looking at a horse like risk taking now granted if you want to look at it and say risk taking hasn't proven anything away from aqueduct i'm not going to argue with you when you compare that to greatest honor who has won well at aqueduct already in his career he's obviously won a couple races down at Gulfstream, but just head and head i don't know that i see a great deal between the two of them from a talent standpoint they've got the connections they've got the pedigrees this horse, though, because he's doing it in New York at this time, and again, I, I the talent that he's running against could could greatly exaggerate how good he looks because perhaps he is taking on inferior company. But I like the progression you've seen from this horse since Chad Brown moved him back to the dirt, stretched him out in distance, and equipped him with the blinkers. He's had the blinkers on in each of the past two starts. He has that nice little progression I'm looking for. I'm a big proponent of the idea of small moves forward. I don't need you to improve by 25 buyer points. He earned an 82 in that maiden score two starts back. That was in mid-December. He comes back with a little bit of time off, earns an 89 here, finishes well again. I mean, this is two consecutive starts. He got his final eighth and 12 and three. In that maiden score, he gets his final eighth and thirteen and one or thirteen flat here. I I think I he's I I'm gonna go as far as to say he is probably one of the more appealing prospects at this point to me for the Kentucky Derby. I think I think there is I think there's something here. And I like that Chad Brown has made it clear that under no circumstances are we gonna turn him back in distance. Which makes this, again, I think it's another reason that the New York path suffers. Not only because of the weather, not only because, you know, you're probably taking on inferior company at this time of year. But to go from a mile and an eighth in the Wizards to a one-turn mile in the Gotham next month, and then back out to a mile and an eighth in the Wood, far from ideal if you're trying to get ready for a race at a mile and a quarter. So it sounds like they're going to just wait until the Wood, which will be at the beginning of April, Give him some more time. And frankly, from a spacing standpoint, that's not dissimilar from the maiden run to this one here in the Withers. I'm I'm very intrigued by risk-taking. I think there might be something here for Chad. Now, Overtook. He is the other one in here that I'm very, very interested in. But, but I, I don't see it for the first Saturday in May. I just don't. To me, this horse has too many things that he needs to iron out but I think there is talent here. Now, he needs some more early speed. He needs to just get involved a little bit earlier on. But when you look at him from a pedigree standpoint, you know, clearly clearly there, there was enough there for them to pay a million dollars for him. But pedigree-wise, Curlin, obvious, got lucky. She was a grade one winner going long. She won the spinster down at Keeneland. You look at some of the other names on the damn side of the pedigree. Girolamo, daydreaming. Uh, you know, this is a pedigree that suggests distance will be his friend. And when I watch him run in this race, for how hard Manny had to work, 
for the amount of ground that the horse covered and still the way that he finished, he, he reminds me a lot of, and I said it in one of the first pods last year, you can go back and find it. It was after either the Fountain of Youth or the Holy Bull. I said it about Chad Brown's country grammar. I said, I, you know, I think there's something here. I don't think the Derby is going to work for him. I think it's going to be too quick. I think he's going to be a summer horse. I think he's going to be a Saratoga horse. And that's, I'll plant my flag in that right now with this horse. I think overtook. I just think the triple crown, if we're being honest, I think that's probably too ambitious right now. I think this is a horse that's got some things to iron out for Todd Pletcher, but I think there's talent here. And I think you're going to see him at Saratoga. I don't know if he's going to win the Travers or the Jim Dandy or anything like that. Maybe it's the curling. I have no idea. I think he's going to be a Saratoga type that's going to want a mile and an eighth to a mile and a quarter when it's all said and done. And I wouldn't just write him off just yet. I think I think the Triple Crown's probably asking a bit much. He's still got a lot to figure out. But I think Overtook, I think he's the summer, summertime horse. I think you can see him do some things up at Saratoga. Capo Kane thought he ran fine. Again, distance in my opinion. I think he wants a mile to a mile and a 16th. Royal number wouldn't be opposed to seeing the connections take sort of the Maryland path perhaps to the Preakness, try to get through that Federico Tessio. Um, I, you know, I thought he ran fine here, but he was no match for for the top two. Um, and the rest of the field, I really don't have a heck of a lot to add. Uh, I, I'm really I'm intrigued with the top two. I think they're both very, very intriguing prospects, one of them for the immediate and one of them for the future. Overtook, I think you're going to see him do some things at Saratoga. Risk-taking, I, I find him very, very compelling. When we talk about Derby prospects, I think Chad Brown might have something here. That's what happened in New York on Saturday. What are your thoughts beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter at Bernie or underscore Matt? Let's see what happened in Oldsmar, Florida on Saturday with the Sam F. Davis. Left out the big piece as far as the Derby grade for that Withers. Overall, I, I gave it a six on the strength of what I think anyway, the perceived strength of those top two runners. Nothing against the rest of the field, but I think the top two, specifically the winner risk-taking, I think he at least elevates it to a level of, you know what, that actually might be a race that we look back on in a few months' time and say that that was when you started to see the the makings of a horse who could perhaps hit the board or get involved in one of those triple crown races. Now, on the same day, in a much warmer area, Oldsmar, Florida, you had the Sam F. Davis stakes. This video over on YouTube, over on Tampa Bay Downs page. This is, I believe, a new page for them. They've uploaded every one of their races, which is a beautiful thing. For those of you, again, if you don't subscribe to some sort of replay service or you don't love the way that it comes in in your ADW, you got YouTube for many of these places. So good on Tampa Bay Downs for doing that. This was a race that I had a pretty strong opinion on. I liked Candyman Rocket, and it really... As good as he was break, breaking his maiden at Gulfstream going shorter, it had just as much to do with the rest of the field because this didn't seem like it was a group loaded with superstars. For being honest, recently the Sam F. Davis hasn't been the strongest path to the Kentucky Derby, but it still is a race where you get 10 points if you win the thing. They're going to break from the gate, and you're going to see Candyman Rocket is forwardly placed. He's going to be about four or five paths wide. You're going to see Boca Boy streak out there to the front end. The fractions that are set in this race, they, you know, in the grand scheme of things, honest, 23 and 1, 46 and 4 for a half, 10 and 4 for three quarters. They stopped the clock in 44 and 1. Rounding this first turn, we've got a lot going on here. Okay, you've got the honest pace from Boca Boy, who's coming off of a layoff and obviously a bit of a longer shot on the board. You've got Candyman Rocket taking up by, for all intents and purposes, a, a very, very comfortable trip position in the clear perched out there that's where you want to be at tampa bay downs smiley sabatka was a horse who take who took plenty of sort of support at the windows but down to six to one making his first start off of a little bit of a layoff the the big name though that people were really intrigued by is this horse back here the number three between horses that's known agenda now known agenda is a fascinating case because he defeated Greatest Honor to break his maiden in early November at Aqueduct. Greatest Honor has since come back to win Great Stakes races down at Gulfstream Park. So you think, well, maybe they're just going to follow sort of parallel paths. Mm, not, not so fast. So we let the tape run. I don't think this is a particularly eventful race, and I'm not going to try to sit here and make things out of what I, I don't see. 
I'm not going to try to turn something into something. It, it just, it, it, for the most part, I thought it was a pretty straightforward trip for the winner, Candyman Rocket. He's perched out there in a nice position beneath Junior Alvarado. Uh, the question was going to be distance, but again, at Tampa Bay Downs, not only would you prefer to be outside, but also being forwardly placed kind of helps your cause and routes of ground on dirt. The number eight Nova Rags, I thought it was a solid effort from him. You're going to see him eventually shift down to the inside to try to come with a run. Perhaps a little bit of a tactical error, but at the same time, I don't know that I can say that. Sammy Camacho rides at Tampa day in and day out, so he would know better than anyone where you want to be and where you don't want to be on the racetrack, but something maybe if you're looking to really critique. Uh, you can see the number one down there, Hidden Stash. He's going to come with a little bit of a late bid. By the way, you still don't see the three horse anywhere. We've gone three quarters and ten and four. We're about to hit the top of the lane. Here's his known agenda. Way the hell back here. He's in the nosebleeds. He is miles out of this thing. And I you know, I don't know what you want to do with this race from a horse like this, if we're being honest. Top of the lane, the leaders hit there. They turn for home. Nice lead change here for Candyman Rock. It does everything very, very professionally. Finishes willingly. If I'm being honest, I think he's starting to get a little bit short at the end. Uh, but first time going out to two turns, first time against winners, number of reasons why you could potentially sort of build in or make a case that, you know what, he, he did just fine. You see Hidden Stash rolling here. You're going to also see Known Agenda rolling from the back of the pack. I, I mean, look, first things first. Talked about it just earlier. This path, this, this Sam F. Davis has not been the most productive race recently. Doesn't mean that it can't be, but recently it hasn't. From a trip standpoint, I think Candyman Rocket arguably had the trip of all trips that you want. And when I say, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that as a negative. I thought he had everything kind of go the way that you would like it to go at Tampa Bay Downs. And again, you want to give him some credit for that because he has that natural speed, that ability to get out there, put himself in good position, not dependent on the lead, uh, can clearly handle a route of ground. I am leery about how far he's going to want to go. That was my only real concern going into it was maybe in time he'll prove to be a one-turn horse as opposed to two. Doesn't mean he's incapable of getting it at this point in the year. I think at this time of season, it, talent's going to outweigh you know the pedigree aspects of things. You'll really start to put that together as you get closer to the Derby and over the summer. But all things considered, I thought it was a pretty perfect trip, and I thought it was a good effort. He earned an 85 buyer here. He has now paired up 85 buyer speed figures, which... Uh, if you're new to the program or you're new to the pod, something I always look for, I think that precedes potentially a forward move, which is a, a, a positive omen. But again, if I'm not thrilled with, I don't want to say thrilled, I thought his finish was fine and just fine. I don't know that I need to take him at a shorter price wherever his next race is, whether it ends up being the Tampa Bay Derby or they send him back to Gulfstream or they send him somewhere else. I just, I'm, I'm unsure how I feel about him overall going forward if he returns in his next start puts up another big number wins for fun then yeah I'll, I'll reconsider things at a mile and a 16th or at a mile and an eighth but right now I feel like this was the perfect opportunity in the perfect time he caught the field he got the trip and he got the job done Nova Rags again I mentioned that little piece where Sammy Camacho brings him down to the inside I don't think that made the difference um nice horse I don't know what his his overall sort of ceiling is. Um, I don't right now feel like he's a, a superstar, but you know what? It's early. Many of these horses have only run four or five times. So, so many things can change between now and whatever they're going to end up being. But I'm, I think he's fine. He got an 83 buyer. Hidden Stash also earned an 83 buyer. Maybe you want to give him the benefit of the doubt. This is his first start since the end of November as a two-year-old. He took some money. He finished well, uh, I believe, from an incremental standpoint. He had the second fastest come home time in the race with 32.86. So a fine effort. Again, left lead at the end. I'm never going to love that. But maybe that's your cup of tea. Boca Boy goes out there. Shows us some speed. He's another one. He hadn't been seen since the end of September. So he had every right to get a little bit tired at the end of the run. Fine effort. Known agenda is sort of the crux of the whole race for, I'm sure, many people. Because he was bet down to 7-5. to five, And typically when you see Pletcher and Velasquez at Tampa this time of year, they're, they're going to run. And not only did the horse really not run... He, he just, he feels like, you know, I just spoke about the the Pletcher horse up in New York that I like. 
he feels like an incomplete project, but I at least saw something, I think. This horse, I get it. If you want to say, well, he finished in 32.25. He finished faster than anybody else. Yeah, but, and and I will say, I'll give credit. Uh, Gabby Gaudet was on TVG before the race, and she said that she chatted with Johnny V, and, and Velasquez had said that this horse has been a bit of a, a bit of a problem child where he's not been the easiest to get along with in the afternoons. And, and perhaps he is just still continuing to put things together. My bigger concern with known agenda is it felt like this was all part of the plan. We're going to go through Tampa. We're going to have him ready to roll. No problems. We'll move on. And, and again, that doesn't mean that he can't move forward from this race, but I just, I, and I'm sure some folks will hear this and say, well, what the hell's the difference between this race and the Withers with that horse? I'm thinking from a Derby standpoint, you know what? I, I don't have a problem looking at a horse like Overtook in New York and saying, you know what? I think the connections will look at it and say, he needs time. We're going to focus on Saratoga. With this horse, known agenda, I feel like the expectation was there for something better than this. Now, maybe the Tampa Bay Derby or maybe whatever the next step for him is going to be is when he takes that step forward. I just didn't think it was all that impressive. And and you're also now dealing with the reality that he has run four times at distances between six and a half furlongs and nine furlongs. And he has earned buyer speed figures of 76, 79, 80, and 78. I'll give him the first off the bench in that he can move forward. Maybe he needed to shake the rust off. Pretty darn quick, though, he's going to need to start getting faster because these are the kind of horses that I think are very dangerous and not in a good way. I say dangerous in that the connections are there, the pedigree's there. It all looks beautiful. And when push comes to shove, you just have a decent horse for this level. You know, when I say decent, it's all relative. Um, I'm not I'm not enamored by known agenda. Let me know if you think I'm crazy for saying that or if if you agree beneath the video player on YouTube. As a whole, I don't love this race. Um, I, I'm going to give it a four, which to date would be the lowest grade for the Kentucky Derby preps that I've done here on this show. Um, I, I think it was a, a fair race. All around, uh, all around. I, I thought Candyman Rocket had the good trip, and I thought he ran just fine. I'm dubious about him going longer against better horses at a track that may not necessarily be so kind to him with better horses and all that jazz. I could be entirely wrong. We'll find out. I'm approaching him right now as if I got him at the right time, and and next time prove to me at a shorter price that you know, you are actually this good. Um, but he does have that nice angle in his back pocket that I always love to see, the paired-up buyer tops of 85. And he goes out for the Hall of Famer, Bill Mott. Mott with the exacta down at Tampa on Saturday afternoon in the Sam F. Davis. I'm giving this race a four. I'm giving the Withers a six out of 10. Let me know what your thoughts are about these two derby preps. There will be more preps to recap as we come back next week, the Risen Star is the one that comes to mind immediately down at the fairgrounds. Looks like a big full field. But before we get to Saturday, and I'm not going to be going over the race on this program, but point meaning chronologically, we have Friday. And Friday means the Friday feature. And this week we have Peter Appleby and Peter Visco going to help us take a look at the late pick four at Oaklawn Park, including the Friday feature itself. That is the nightcap race number nine. If you want to be in the position the Peters are in this week, you need to leave your selection beneath the video player on YouTube. I'll contact you if you are correct. Without further ado, let's get into this week's Friday feature. All right, Friday feature time looks a little bit different this week. For the first time, we have multiple people in here at once. You know, I, I was one of my favorite things, one of my favorite episodes thus far was the Breeders' Cup show where all of you, the viewers and listeners, sent in selections and ideas and things of that nature. This is just a little bit different. We were hopeful to have four. Tom Espinosa couldn't make it happen for this time. We'll get Tom back on the show soon enough. But in the meantime, I think we've got a pretty good group together, a couple of return sort of guests for the Friday feature. We'll take them right in alphabetical order. We'll start with Peter Appleby. Peter, thanks for some time. How are you? Well, Matt, how are you? 
I'm doing well. Hanging in there. We've we've got snow. We had snow this past weekend. We've got snow on and off coming up this week. It is what it is. I'm happy that we are, I at least look at it, and I don't know again where you guys are, but I, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I know that whatever snow comes, hopefully, knock on wood, three, four weeks from now, it's going to be gone and we'll be getting into warmer weather. So feeling pretty good. And Peter Visco, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Thanks for having me again, man. I appreciate it. So this week, we're going to go over the late pick four at Oaklawn Park on Friday. I was uh, DMing with these fellas earlier in the week, or last week, I should say, and it's a little bit of a crapshoot simply because it looks like the weather all week all across the country where we are racing or where our interests are looks a little bit dodgy. Friday down in Hot Springs looks to be the best of the days, but Wednesday and Thursday, it does look like there is some rain. So this could be a very interesting sequence simply because we have no idea what the track conditions actually going to be when push comes to shove. From a Friday feature standpoint, the race we will be talking about and that will count toward the contest will be the nightcap race number nine. If you want to be involved or be where either of these gentlemen are next week, you need to leave your selection beneath the video player. I'll contact you if you're correct. But before that, we're going to go through this pick four sequence. And similar to the way that Howard Kravitz and I went through that sequence a couple weeks ago down at Gulfstream, uh, the three of us are going to go through and offer up one horse per race. If there is overlap, so be it. Not the end of the world. At most, this is a ticket for $0.50 cents that would cost $40.50 if we all have unique opinions in all four races. So it's an economic ticket. I think it's one of those instances where, again, and I, I sound like a broken record, don't just play it just to play it. I'm going to play it because I feel like we've put in the time and why not. But if you want to chop away, you want to add to it, whatever your budget constraints are, feel free to play around with it. But I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of try this piece out again. People enjoyed the segment that Howard and I did. So let's see if, if myself and the two Peters can get things going in the right direction. We'll start off with race number six. It's a $16,000 claiming event going six furlongs. Seems to be, according to Time Form US, a fair amount of pace signed on. Two horses figure to be forwardly placed. Uh, and we will go right in alphabetical order. Let's start off with Peter Appleby. Who did you land on in race six on Friday? I landed on seven Rockshaw for my pick. Um, not just that horse, but a number of these horses in the pick four. I'm a little suspect of the morning line. I don't know the morning line maker in Oakland, but I'm probably spoiled with David Aragona here in New York, which is where I normally play. Um, I went with Rockshaw. He's coming off um, uh, a decent layoff. Uh, ran competitive figs last spring. Obviously had an issue back last May and has been off since then. Uh, and now comes back with a with a couple of nice works at Oakland coming into this. <clears throat> My assumption is rare form uh, will take most of the money here. Um, if rare form repeats that performance, uh, from November in Churchill, probably wins. Uh, but he's cutting back to uh, to six furlongs from a mile. Um, and while turn backs are a nice angle sometimes, you kind of wonder was was last time the time, I guess, uh, was my thinking on that one. And I think the three and the nine, as you said, will be going. And the uh, the seven can sit a trip off of them and, and kick on home from there. So I went with seven Rockshaw. Seven Rockshaw is the first of our three, possibly three anyway, for the opening leg of the Blake pick four on Friday. Peter Visco, where did you land in this race? Actually, it's funny. I'm glad Peter Appleby landed on the seven because the seven was my second choice. And I, it was one of those where if it probably wasn't such a long layoff, I might have gone with the seven as well. But unfortunately, for money purposes, I landed on the three rare form. Um for some of the things that, that Peter mentioned, I mean, he's got some back class and grade three races back earlier in 2020, that last race with the nice figure right on the front end, cutting back, which you, you sort of like, like he said, normally you sort of like the cut back, especially with a horse with some speed. And this one's been able to hold it a little bit longer. So I really like the cut back. Theodoro has been hot. So, um, there were just a lot of angles that led to the three, which is probably why he's the morning line favorite. So that's where I landed, but I'm happy to have the seven in our sequence just because I sort of like that horse as well. And again, if it wasn't for the, the long layoff, I think that one would have a, an even better shot and probably be lower odds too. But it may. I think Peter Appleby, I agree with you. I think the odds are a little funny. The morning line odds are a little funny in this race. Yeah, and it seems like, and again, not to throw shade at, at certain people, it, it is what it is, but I, I've heard from enough folks that, you know, take the morning line down there with a grain of salt because uh, they may end up being considerably different come post time. 
Um, I'm glad that we have two what I think are live shots covered in this sequence. We have one who I think is probably a more likely win contender in the horse for Diodoro's barn. We also have one, though, at what should be a little bit of a better price. Maybe I'm going to land somewhere in between with the number two basic chance, nine to two on the line. You know, a, a horse who is coming back for a barn and an owner combo on the reclaim. I always like to see that angle. I think that that, that speaks volumes, especially for a horse. We're not talking about a spring chicken. This is a seven-year-old. Um, and, and my kind of thought was, if rare form goes, let's say that nine horse on the outside just goes hard enough to soften him up a little bit, and it's combined with coming off the layoff. Maybe basic chance is a horse that could sit a little bit of a trip, maybe two or three lengths off of it and come with some sort of a bid. Has a win at Oakland, and if it ends up being wet, not a problem for this one. So, First leg for us, race six on Friday at Oaklawn. We have the two, the three, and the seven. Let's move on to race number seven, the second leg of the sequence. Maiden $30,000 claimers, and we'll go in reverse order this time around, so I'll kick things off because I don't have a very interesting opinion in here. It's scheduled to be a field of 11, again, going three quarters. I, I can't help but notice that, and again, Oaklawn, it, it's not listed in my conditions anyway that I'm seeing, but they do offer uh, waivers as far as some of these maiden claimers and claiming races are concerned. And the number three secret mistress, first time going out for Ron Moquette's barn, is the only horse I believe in here that is not, right now anyway, in for a tag. And you can kind of understand why, based on that career debut down at Gulfstream, going six furlongs in early December, showed big speed out of the gate at 20-1, to 1, and really, I thought, ran a winning race. They were about a country mile clear of the rest of the field, and she just unfortunately got a little bit short at the end and got run down by the 5-2 to two shot Pine Leaf who got the job done. So, I, again, I don't have anything really brilliant here. I think the five to two morning line's a pipe dream. I think this horse is probably going to be four to five. Um, but at the same time, if we're going to get creative, maybe we can catch some prices. It was one that I felt like playing the sequence. I, I just I didn't have any interest in trying to beat her. So I'm on board with the three secret mistress, Peter Visco. Where are you going? Unfortunately, Matt, I'm with you. I, <laughs> I just didn't see much else. I. I... The, the figure, I mean, maybe the figure was inflated or maybe there was something going on there, but the figure, Rosario listed, Moquette's been hot. Um, the only thing I saw was the second career race for Moquette and had like an 8% win percentage. I was like, yeah, maybe that, maybe that's something that can get this horse beat, but on paper, I'm just not seeing too much. The only other horse I sort of looked at was the one Wildwood Flash, but I could tell you that I'm horrible picking first-time starters. I never seem to pick that first-time starter who blows the doors off. I seem to pick the ones who stumble out of the gate and wind up finishing, you know, a, a bad eighth. But <laughs> there were just a couple. There were a couple angles I liked with the one, but not enough to, to not enough to put him on top, or I should say, her on top. Peter Appleby, do you uh, have anything that was a little more creative than uh, Peter Visco or I did? I did. Okay, good. I agree that the three is the likely winner and you should have them on any ticket you have, right? Of course. Um, my pick here is the 10. Dwayne Lucas. Fortuna Aduvat. That is part of Fortune Favors the Bold. I, my Latin is halfway decent. I had to look that one up to make sure. And Lucas is certainly being bold here. This is a horse at a point of entry by Dynaformer and straight back fast out of English Channel. You couldn't have better marathon turf breeding in any horse right so what's it doing here that's a good question lucas knows what he's doing he's still winning races at 80 whatever he is now yeah um pretty amazing um blinkers on lasix on uh had did not show much in his first couple of starts the workout tab is very good especially for this level at Oak Lawn, including a, a bullet three furlong work to get some speed into him back in early January. The breeding angle on this would scream long on the turf, except the dam strike back fast, only won two races, I think out of 22 starts, both on the dirt, one sprinting, one going a mile on the dirt. So I imagine he's thinking, hmm, we'll take a crack here and see what we can find out, uh, you know, sprinting on the dirt, draws outside, a good draw. I don't think it's going to be six to one. I think it's going to be 16 to one sure, uh, or better because it, you're really taking a shot. I'm looking at an active work tab and a little bit of an oddball against the grain profile on the breeding is why I went with, with 10, but yes, you, you, you've got to cover, you've got to cover three in a multi. 
So there you have it. We have the three and the 10 for the second leg of this sequence. But worth noting, again, if you're somebody who was going to spread a little bit deeper, consider Peter Visco's other sort of shout out there down on the inside. The number one Wildwood Flash tourists about uh, roughly just a 12%, I'd say, with first time starters. So maybe one that you want to include if you are going to spread out a little bit deeper than what we're going to. Third leg of this sequence, race number eight, a mile, main track. It's an optional claiming event, but it's actually for non-winners of four lifetime. So it's an interesting little spot for a number of reasons. You have, I feel like it's a very cushy position for some horses to be coming back off of lengthy layoffs. You've got horses with stakes sort of, I don't, they have stakes ability. I don't think you have any superstars in here, but you've got horses that this is a really nice sort of just shake the rust off opportunity to get them ready for something else. Having said that, two of the heavier or the more logical runners in this race are cross-entered for a turf stakes race at the fairgrounds on Saturday afternoon. So there's a real chance that the two Miz and Bo and the three Dream a Little Dream of You don't go in this spot. It's also worth noting the one, Golub the Great, is cross-entered in a race at Oaklawn, I believe the day prior on Thursday. So there are a number of different things that could go on in this race about who actually does go and doesn't go. We'll kick things off with you, Peter Appleby. I know we had talked about this, and, and we'll call it our little contingency plan, but enlighten us. What are your thoughts on the race? Yeah, if Miz and Boo goes, I think, I think that's the pick. Um, I'm not, I'm, it's an interesting cross-entry because that's a, you know, you said it's a turf race at fairgrounds, an overnight stakes race there in the Al Stahl. Um, so, you know, tried the turf early on without success, but on the dirt, so-so. Um, certainly seems to be the classiest horse here. Um, I did try to randomly tweet Norm Cass last night and see if he would answer where he was going to run, but he did not respond, which is no offense taken. That's the great thing about Twitter. You can fire away and maybe somebody responds, but I did not hear back from, from Norm. Um, if the two does not go, uh, I would go with five, Kim K. Uh, showed significant improvement uh, when the barns changed, came east from, uh, from the West Coast and Peter Miller's barn, went to Asmussen, has Santana up, the figures match. It's got uh, good early speed and, and decent late speed. Um, like that's the winner of the five. The two does not go. Peter Visco, where, where did you land in this race? I wound up with the seven piece of my heart. Um, I agree with Peter that the two, and actually in my book, the two and the five were the most likely winners just from sort of a class standpoint and a, just a form standpoint. But I figured that neither one, they both had just enough warts where I figured somebody could take them down if they if they if they all go. So with the seven, I liked, I mean, simple stuff with them. Probably her two best races were at Oaklawn. Two two nice figures, um, decent company, a little better company than this. Still went to the top on one, came from off the pace in the other, so showed a little bit of versatility. I sort of like that. Um, Trainers, trainers 0 for 11 on the year, so maybe, maybe just maybe do for one. Um, has a good has a good percentage on route races though, so I figured uh, with that and the, the the combination of horse for the course maybe kind of thing, um, I figured it's a good way to maybe take down one of the favorites. I have to imagine if the two doesn't run, the five will probably get bet down pretty low. So hopefully the seven, you know, maybe if it's a really short field, they're all going to be pretty low, but. Maybe the seven's a little bit worth it, a little bit more value than than some of the others. I also am on the seven piece of my heart, you know, for many of the reasons you alluded to, Peter. You know, you could argue that the two best races came at Oaklawn Park. Um, I like that all three victories lifetime have come in route races. This is clearly what her game is. She's not a horse that wants one turn. Um, the two graded stakes tries, I, I really don't want to hold those against her. You'll note that they came after a little bit of a layoff, that first one in the Delaware Oaks. And that, that Monmouth Oaks race, I, I do with it what you will. Monmouth's a funny track. Some horses like it, some don't. And I guess you could say that really about any racetrack. You know, some horses appreciate it, some horses don't. Um, the greats can run anywhere. Piece of my heart clearly likes Oaklawn Park. And the other piece I do enjoy about her, or I find appealing, not only is she proved on a wet track if it does come up off, but she has speed but doesn't have to have the lead, you know, at, at no holds barred. I think it's a scenario where... If for whatever reason the pace doesn't materialize, she can go and dictate the fractions and maybe use that to her advantage. And conversely, if they throw it down early, if somebody just catches a flyer out of the gate to the inside, she's content sitting and still being effective. So right now, 
it looks like the two Mizzen Bow and the seven piece of my heart. If Mizzen Bow doesn't go, we'll have the five Kim K in the seven piece of my heart. So this is looking like a nice, tidy little ticket that we're putting together here. As we get to the last leg, the payoff leg, this is going to be the Friday feature. So again, if you want to be in the position that the two Peters are in here today, next Monday, you need to leave your select. Actually, I believe next Monday is a holiday. So it might actually be next Tuesday. Let's plan on that. Next Tuesday is when the show will be recorded. If you want to be in their position, leave your selection for race nine at Oakland beneath the video player on YouTube. If you're right, I'll contact you. It's a starter allowance, a mile and a 16th. Uh, I will kick things off. We'll go in reverse order this time around. It's a horse that I, I'm going to be betting regardless. And, you know, <laughs> we alluded to it. You never know with morning lines and things like that. And I'll admit there are some... There, there are some red flags with this horse, and, and no pun intended. I like the number nine red again. Uh, Ten to one on the morning line. Second time off the layoff here, going out for Aaron Shorter's barn. The big concern for me, I actually thought the most recent start was it was pretty good. All things considered, there was a hot pace sign on. This horse was just gunned out of there. There was another horse that he got hooked up with. The two of them set wicked fractions. The pace fell apart. Set up really nicely for horses coming from off of it. This horse didn't change leads in this race. And didn't change leads in the October 17th race at Delaware Park preceding a lengthy layoff. Prior to that, this horse changed leads on cue. So, as a seven-year-old, it does concern me a little bit that perhaps a little bit ouchy. Maybe we're not kind of, you know, we're not that spring chicken anymore. We're not feeling great all the time. But I'm hopeful that the pace dynamics of this race are going to be, I don't want to say a 180, but, but darn close to it. Where Red again can get out there, cut out the fractions, and try to take this field gate to wire I don't know if you get the 10 to 1, but I'm hopeful you get at least 5 or 6 to 1. So I'm going to go with the number 9, Red again. Peter Visco, where are you going? Uh, I have a pretty boring one in this one. I went with the 1, uh, Froster Fribbery. Just on paper, there's really not much this horse does wrong. Loves the track, loves the distance. Um, Rosario, again, is booked on there currently. Uh, Brad Cox, I mean... There's not much you could say. I mean, there's not much you could say negative. I mean, looks a little bit like, hey, maybe you catch like you're talking about. Maybe if something like the nine can go out or the the nine goes out and maybe can can set a slow pace and the one gets hung up somewhere, gets maybe shuffled back and, and then maybe makes a late run and can't get there, then you're, you maybe can look at a nice price on top. But if all goes as planned, I feel like the one is, is unfortunately tough to beat. So... Nothing too exciting. I guess the, the funny one was the 10 to me. I don't know if, if uh, Peter's going to talk about the 10 at all, but just those two last races are, are kind of wild. You don't see that that often where a horse goes that nuts. Um, they were both in the mud, so maybe that had something to do with it, but even then. So I looked at that one, um, but, you know, I, I just don't trust those, so I'll stick with the one, unfortunately. It just seems like a horse you can't leave off the ticket. Well, and, and you know, you brought up the pace scenario too. I, I guess the good news for a horse like Froster Frippery, I mean, not only the obvious piece that six for nine lifetime at Oaklawn, never been out of the exacta in nine starts at Oaklawn Park, but it's not as though this one doesn't have the ability to get a little bit closer to the front end. I think, at least just my opinion, I think the reason that this horse was so far back in that most recent start was because the pace was so wicked. I think he would at least have a versatile running style. And if Rosario is indeed the rider who he's listed to ride right now, I mean, he, he's as good as anyone at being able to kind of read what we're dealing with here, read the tea leaves and say, if we got to be a little bit closer from the inside, let's do it and take up sort of a pocket spot. If the pace materializes, we know we can rally from well off of it. So we right now have the nine red again, the number one frost of frippery. Peter Appleby, are we adding anyone else to the mix? I have the very creative uh, opinion of picking the 22 time winner that's going to be four to five probably. <laughs> I, I would single Froster Frippery in this race if I was playing a, a ticket on my own, probably. Um, the, the 10 is interesting, but those last two in the mud and Mountaineer, you're, it was 1 to 10 and 2 to 5. I'm not sure what it was running against. Um, I, I think the one, the, 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 for what you said, Matt, it can be up close on a slower pace. It obviously is shown it can win and keep closing if the pace gets hot. Um, you know, the horse has run 67 times and has been in the triple 70 percent of the time that's an amazing crazy you don't see horses like that yeah. anymore the old hard knocking claiming horses they seem to go by the wayside um so i was going with the one i did not have anything creative here at all sorry no and and you know the i guess we can throw out let's say the sort of go back to uh peter visco's idea with the number 10 darren's fortune 
I, I, there are two fascinating things to me with a horse like this. If it is a wet track, I think you absolutely want to at least consider using the horse. Now, on the flip side, my I don't want to say my concern because the horses run well at a mile and a sixteenth in the past. But it, it's when you see a mile and five eighths and a mile and three quarters, and the horse wins by you know seven miles. It, it makes me think, all right, well, this is probably something that I, it's a combination of things. I, I shouldn't just throw blanket statements out there because without knowing, you know, the extent of how Mountaineer was playing that given day. I know sometimes it's a complete conveyor belt. I know sometimes, you know, the inside is like quicksand, you know, without having complete knowledge of the situation, it's difficult for me to just sit there and throw things out there. But again, we're, we're dealing with, at least based on the ticket that we've put together, you, you could really afford to, to start using some creative horses in there. And a horse like Darren's Fortune, you know, for the reason that I think the three of us have chatted about, Frost or Frippery is very likely to be a heavy favorite. Um, and Red again, you know, I, I raised the red flags that I have or the concerns that I might have with this one. So maybe you do want to use a couple other ones. Or if you are just locked in saying, you know what, Frost or Frippery is going to win this race, we'll single there and then we'll use some other added horses in those other three legs. So for a quick review... The first leg, we have the two basic chance, the three rare form, the seven Rockshaw. The second leg, we have the three secret mistress and the ten Fortuna Aduvat. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, the third leg, we have the two Mizzen Bow or the five Kim K if Mizzen Bow does scratch and go to the fairgrounds for that stakes race on grass, along with the seven piece of my heart. And in the nightcap, we have the one Froster Frippery. And the number nine, red again. I am not a mathematician, but I believe if I'm doing my math correct, that's a $12 ticket for a 50 cent base bet. So you can either play that for 50 cents, you can press it up. I mean, heck, you could play that for five bucks and it's only going to cost you $60. You know, it's not like we're dealing with anything crazy. Um, overall thoughts on anything, whether it's this sequence. Oh, and by the way, this is the Friday feature. Again, you want to keep in mind this race you got to leave your selection beneath the video player. If you're going to get involved with Frost or Frippery, good on you. If you're going to take the speed, good on you. If you're going to take a horse like Darren's Fortune or somebody else who we haven't even talked about, leave it beneath the video player on YouTube if you're right. I'll contact you. Do you guys have any other sort of overriding thoughts about this sequence, about any of the prep races we've seen so far? Before we button things up, we'll start with you, Peter Visco. Um, no, I was actually pleasantly surprised by the sequence, aside from aside from coming up with a few too many favorites, I thought they were some pretty competitive races. And um, I felt like in a couple of them, you could go deep. Like if you do like the, the one in this last one, you can go a little deeper in some of the other ones and see if you can maybe catch a price. And, you know, anytime you can do that, it's great. And if you can get a single, obviously you can, you can build up. I know Peter Appleby mentioned the all button in, in, in one of his, uh, one of our IM chats, but it was like, in this race, you could probably do that maybe in, say, the first leg, where there's probably not going to be a big favorite. So I sort of just like that. And then, not to drone on, but I have to um, represent my Moonlight Dioro from the weekend. Um, last time I was on, it was the week of the Derby, and I had my authentic shirt yeah. on, and he won the Derby. So maybe this time will be good luck, and we have a we have an Oaks horse coming here. So, so we'll see. I wasn't sure if you were doing any recaps today, so I didn't know if you were going to talk about that one at all. I'm going to go over, so I'm recording this segment actually first. I'll go back over the derby preps from the weekend prior, but I had mentioned I was on with uh, my friend John Englehart last week, uh, on Thursday night on his program, uh, Winning Ponies, and, and brought up Moonlight Doro, and, and I said, you know, I, I think Richard Mandela has a, she has, the, she just fits that profile. I'm not saying she's going to be Beholder, I'm not saying she's going to be Paradise Woods, you have no idea, but she does have that sort of she has that feel to her that she could be a horse who will at least take you to the Santa Anita Oaks. And who knows, maybe that first, fr I can't even say it's the first Friday in May. It's actually the last Friday in April this year, which I think is, I, yeah, I, th I think it's a fun little, you know, just a little side piece there, but um, congratulations with her. And hopefully everything continues on, uh, on, on the right track, because again, she's in great hands and um, you know, it's always exciting when you've got any, any rooting interest at this time of year going through all the steps. So we'll see what we get from Moonlight Doro as she continues on her path to the Santa Anita Oaks. Uh, Peter Appleby, any uh, thoughts about the sequence in general, prep races, anything that you want to get out there? Uh, sequence is actually very playable. As, as people will see, the three of us didn't coordinate our picks and you can get narrow and wide in different spots and have a nice ticket for, you know, 20, 30 bucks and, and, yep. and cover a lot of live horses and, 
you should probably get a, a decent payout. I think probably in the ninth race, you'll get a real short favorite. The other ones, I think, will get, get spread around a little bit. I just did want to mention, I meant to mention when we were talking about the seventh race, that uh, John Court has a mount in that race, and he's riding into Oaklawn. And while we always focus on the two-year-olds and three-year-olds and the hot new trainers and the hot young jockeys, John Court is 60 years old. He has been riding since 1980 and was an apprentice at Oaklawn in 1981. And he's still winning races, which is fantastic. And, and you know what? I mean, look, Lens Gold, say what you will, the horse is bet down to six to one in the career debut. It's not like the horse was, you know, in as a no hoper. Oh, we got a little bit of a pop up there. Um, it's not as if the horse is a no hoper. Now we get that sort of class relief that you've seen so often work going from the special down to the claiming for that second time out. Showed speed in that debut, too. So maybe that's a horse at 30 to one you want to consider adding to the ticket again. We've made it clear. It's, it's an interesting sequence. We've got a nice tight little ticket, but feel free to spread out in some of those races where it looks like we could get creative. It looks like Zoom is telling me we got to wrap this thing up. So, gentlemen, thank you for your time this afternoon. Great analysis. And, again, for those of you that are watching, you want to play, listen, you want to play the ticket, go right ahead. You want to add to it, chop it down, do whatever you want. The Friday feature, though, is the ninth, the nightcap at Oaklawn on Friday afternoon. Peter Appleby, Peter Visco, well done, gentlemen. Thank you again. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to the two Peters for helping out with this week's Friday feature. You know the story by now. Look, if you're looking to play the sequence and you don't love our ticket, it's going to be hard to chop much off of it because it's only 12 bucks for 50 cents. But, you know, I think this is the best way to go about doing these sort of things. We'll put out what we're going to put out. I would like to hear some feedback beneath the video player on YouTube. You don't have to offer up a whole ticket. I recognize some people like to play it a little bit tighter to the vest, but give opinions. Let us know if we should have gone deeper in certain legs, if we can just get real narrow and, and, and single in that nightcap, or whatever the case may be. Whatever your opinions are. I think that's that's my hope for what this entire thing is all about. And, and truly, if this is the way folks would rather have the Friday feature go, where we get a little bit more as far as the handicapping goes, and we can go over a sequence or two, um, I'm all ears. I'm open to, to changing things up. It's whatever you guys, the listeners and the viewers, want to hear, I will do. So... There's that. Let's button things up here in episode 52 with an update on the $500 challenge. Full disclosure, I missed one race last week. Uh, I did not get the wager in in time for the withers. Um, so it is what it is. I missed it. Uh, but the update, we've churned $442. The bankroll sits at five, uh, excuse me, at $252.60, just about 14% on the win side of things, 51% uh, in the money. Odds, the average price of these horses going off is 5.21 to 1, which equates to roughly 16 to 17% as far as the win rate is concerned, which would leave this 13.7 or 13.8% win rate uh, about 2 or 3% light. Which, you know what, for as poorly as things started, I'm, I'm entirely comfortable with that. I, I think things are at least okay. They've leveled off anyway. We're starting to kind of dig ourselves out of a bit of a hole. So uh, again, no real time frame for this, just kind of chugging along. Uh, 240, or excuse me, $442 have been churned, hoping to get to that $10,000 magic number. So uh, we will see how things continue to progress. I know I've, I've screwed up a couple times already. The show will be recorded Tuesday next week, not Monday. Monday is a holiday. It'll be recorded Tuesday so if you are trying to be involved with the Friday feature, that's when that would be as well. Or if you're just looking for the podcast in general, probably drop Tuesday night early on Wednesday kind of thing, depending on how you listen to it. So uh, we've got that coming up. Things are going to get serious here this weekend. Three derby preps, but specifically the big one is the Risen Star. Effectively, win it and you're in. You've punched your ticket to the starting gate for the Kentucky Derby in May. 50 points go to the winner. It's a big full field. You've got the vast majority of the horses coming out of the Lecompte. You've got some nice fresh faces that are going to go as well. So uh, looking forward to seeing what happens down at the fairgrounds on Saturday afternoon and, and really seeing who is going to basically say we're in. We got one of the 20 tickets. Who else is going to join us? We'll find out. Really looking forward to it. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, as usual, beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. This has been episode 52. Until we meet again next week for episode 53, best of luck, however you play. Whoa. How, I just had a brain fart. Best, best of luck, however you play, whatever you play, and wherever you play. I've only been doing it for 
52 episodes. Uh, good luck this week. See you next week. Matt Burney, your show.